you. You're doing very well. Thank you. He was born in 1939 to Okana Msoke and Lovis and in Kauna village, Mkono district. In his early days at Makerere University, Dr. Reverend Keva Sempanyi was passionate about preaching the gospel. Despite the fact that Sempanyi was not involved in politics during the 1970s, his church summonings annulled the then president Ida Min Dada. One day in 1972, three men from the Fiat State Research Bureau went to a church where Sempanyi was preaching. He remembers that they wore dark glasses and bell bottom trousers. They went straight to the vestry where St. Pange was sitting and they said they were there to kill him. I felt like some kind of acid getting to my tongue. I was, and I was looked like a fool to these people. But God gave me a word to say and I said to this man, and I was quoting I think Colossians 3.3, 3, that I'm a dead person. So, what are you going to kill? And that old man was, became very serious. He said, what do you mean? St. Panja asked to pray for the men, saying this would help them to escape judgment from God. He was shocked that the men accepted his prayers before they could kill him. They closed their eyes. I did not close mine because I didn't want to be killed, to be killed with eyes wide shut. <laughs> <laughs> Simpanj says the men's hearts were softened and they pardoned him. Even after this close shave, Amini's men did not give up on Simpanji. They followed him to his home with the intention of fulfilling their mission. Fortunately, one of the three men who had converted from Islam to Christianity helped Simpanji to escape to Kenya before he ended up in exile in America. There he wrote a book titled a distant grief. In 1979, St. Panji received an invitation to attend the Mosh Conference in Tanzania to raise strategies for removing Idi Amin from power. Nyerere wanted to appear to the international community that he was only the one fighting Idi Amin. But the, the people from Uganda, they had gathered in, uh, in, uh, in Tanzania uh, to remove their leader. So we are actually a, a government in exile. Some of the key delegates at the conference were the now president of Uganda, Yoweri Museveni, Prime Minister Hakana Rugunda, Martin Alike, Professor Tassis Kawejere, Edward Rugumayo, Deletito Okerol Twa, Godfrey Binaisa, Paulo Mwanga, Defto Ito Jok, and Dan Naudere, among others. The meeting bore results and Amin was ousted from power in 1979. Sam Panji and other exiled Ugandans returned to the country. He was part of the first interim government called the National Consultative Council, which was headed by Yusuf Rule. As a state minister for community development, his area of operation was in Acholi and Karamoja regions. According to Sam Panji, Rule made some mistakes and was replaced by Godfrey Binaisa, whose leadership was also short-lived. Oh God and my country. When President Milton Obote's second government took office in 1981, Sempanji contested and won a parliamentary seat from Kono East constituency. He was appointed the government chief whip in parliament. I think this is a fundamental change in the politics of our country. When Obote was overthrown by President Yoweri Museveni in 1985, Sempanji gave politics a rest and returned to church ministry and farming. He contested again in 2001 and won the Tenjuru South constituency seat. When he called me at, at his at his Dwakutula, I don't I remember, I forget there, when we went there with Kagodo, the late, and Musisi, Wanuka Musisi, M7 asked me a question. Why are you still in UPC, you don't join the movement? And I said to him, sir, you remember at Moshi? We said Uganda will never be uh, ruled by the barrel of the gun. But see how we are dressed. Because at that time he was in this army, whatever. So what did, what did he say? He said, bring some milk uh, uh, for the reverend. And that was the end of the discussion. St. Punch says he was convinced to leave the Uganda People's Congress to join the NRM party after President Yoweri Seven retired from the army. Because he was now doing what we agreed upon in, in Moshi. People say that uh, they had given me 200,000 million, whatever. 
I never knew I wasn't given a cent. The eight-year-old is, however, not happy that the party he joined wholeheartedly has failed to fight poverty among Ugandans. Even during the colonial days, I've never seen that kind of poverty. People were had their own dignity, live alone being poor. But now you go to the village, even that dignity is not there. NTV wanted to know why he doesn't seek audience with the president to speak on these issues. The Museveni of today is different from the Museveni who came from the bush and the Museveni who were with in the Moshe conference. So governance is dying away. Now it's survival, how you survive in, 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 in power. That's the concern. So I wouldn't waste my time. He says it's now up to President Yoweri Museveni to make the decision to leave Uganda either in peace or turmoil. I'm not in the mind of Museveni whether he has prepared any any, any succession to know when I leave, I leave these uh, uh, authorities, whatever, in, in the hands of so and so. I, I don't know whether he has any, any person in his mind. But we need to have a peaceful transition to any other regime to take over in Uganda. Without that one, we can end up in chaos. And the chaos will, will demolish, will destroy everything we have earned. The octogenarian says he is enjoying his retirement at home in Mukono district, but also focuses some of his energies on his summer gardens, which sits on 12 acres. Agnes Nandutu, NTV, Living History.